So tonight we're talking about, whoops, tonight we are talking about object-oriented programming. What is object-oriented programming? What we've done till now is we've had things like variables and we've had things like functions and lists and dictionaries. And that's all great. Um, but it would be really nice if we could group functions, um, variables, lists, whatever, into a single entity and use that again and again and again. And that's what object-oriented programming does. And it, it is a very, very powerful tool. I spend the majority of my day doing object-oriented programming. I spent most of today, most of the last week writing Java. Um, which forces you to do object-oriented programming. Python does not. Python allows you to do both object-oriented programming and functional programming. What we have done up until this point is functional programming. But now we're going into this new paradigm. And this paradigm really does provide a way of organizing your code and thinking about your problem that can help make it easier to design and develop and also maintain later on. So there are a few keywords and functions. First, we have a new keyword. The, the new keyword is class, and that defines a collection of related variables and functions. Um, we have a, something called a constructor, and it's got a very, very specific name. It's underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, open parenthesis, self, close parenthesis. This is the thing that takes it from being a definition, which is a class. A class is a definition. It's like a function. It doesn't exist until it's called. Self is used in the class to denote the object that you've instantiated. And I'll get to all of this in a bit of what that means. And an object is an instantiation of a class. So here are the basic concepts that we're going to work with. Data abstraction. Basically, you're hiding the implementation of your code. You're drawing a black box around your code. And you're saying, here are the things you can use, and don't worry about what I do on the inside because I'm always going to give you back the right answer. Um, encapsulation. You're keeping all your states and all your variables and all your methods private unless there's a need to expose them to the outside world. Um, inheritance is the way of extending um, a class. So you can define generic functionality and then define more specific functionality and the specific functionality can inherit all of the general functionality. In polymorphism, um, you can access objects of different types through the same interface. Um, and that is extremely powerful. I use inheritance and polymorphism all the time. And that is because I can publish an interface and then act on different data while the user is still using the same interface. Um, and polymorphism and inheritance work hand in hand. Now, we're not going to get into polymorphism and inheritance tonight, but they are important concepts for you to, to start to learn if you're going to go into the programming world. So, why do I like object-oriented programming? Reusability. It takes reusability to the next level. And basically what you're doing is you're naming this group of stuff you're naming the group of related variables and functions, and you can use it again and again and again. Um, and so it, it just, 
it makes the code better. Less maintenance. If you design your classes right, there will be less code and less maintenance. So what are the building blocks of object-oriented programming? Well, the first is the class. Now, a class is not a thing. The class doesn't exist in the running memory of your program. There is nothing in Python that's going to say that class is taking up a space in your RAM. The only thing class is, is a definition. It's just like a, a blueprint. You have a blueprint for a house. You can't live in that blueprint. You can look at the blueprint. You can get an engineer to look at the blueprint. You can get contractors to build from the blueprint. But until that house is built, you can't, that, that the class, or the blueprint is just a definition on a piece of paper. That's all it is. So the class is the definition. It tells you what you're going to get if you use that class and instantiate an object. Now, a class has a name, pretty much like variable and um, function names. It's the same naming kind of convention. A class will contain variables and functions. Um, it's only a definition, and I already gave you the example of the house and the blueprint. So if, if a class is only a definition, how do I use it? What you do is called instantiation. You tell Python, Python, I have this definition over here, but I want you to create something with that definition, and then I'm going to use that something in my program. And that something, that object that it creates, is available in the running script, it is an access point to the variables and the function definitions using that dot notation that we've seen before. And you can have as many objects of that class as you want. You can have one, you can have 101. It doesn't matter. Python will just keep creating objects of that class when you ask it to do that. So I have one definition and a boatload of different objects. All right, so what are the mechanisms of a class? Well, I have a class. I have a keyword class. Always have to start with the keyword class. It tells Python you are defining a new type. So a class is a type. A string is a type. A float is a type. An integer is a type. A Boolean is a type. And now a class is a type. But the neat thing about a class is that your defining the type. You're telling Python what this thing is about. Um, and what that thing is about is a grouping of variables and functions. So then we have this name. In this case, I just named the class time. Now, like everything you are defining, like functions, in Python, you have to have that colon don't forget the colon. It will drive you crazy. Then we have this very special function called a constructor. Now, what does a constructor do? What a constructor does is it tells Python how to build out your object. Because Python knows nothing about this object. All Python knows is there's this thing called a class, and there's time, and there's going to be variables, and there's going to be functions. But how does it start? What's its initial state? The constructor tells it what its initial state is. So self is a very special keyword, and it tells a function in Python that you are, that it is an instance function. So there are two types of functions. There are instance functions which are exist in every object. It's like you're copying that function into every object. And then there are static functions that exist once in the class. That's it. So if you have self in the argument list of a function, 
you're going, it, Python's going to make a copy of that for every different object. And most of what you're going to do in a class is going to have self. You want them to be instance methods. And then you have what you want to do. So in this case, I have time. And my time is going to have an hour and a minute. Now, in the constructor, I say, I can say, I'm going to have these two variables. I'm going to have an hour and I'm going to have a minute. But because I am in an instance function, in other words, a function that has self as one of the arguments, I'm going to say these are instance variables. So hour is an instance variable and minute is an instance variable. What that means is for every different time object you create, you're going to have a different hour and a different minute. And that's important because you're probably going to want to store different information in each object, possibly compare it. So I say self.hour is an instance variable. The name of the variable is hour. You get to that value hour by always doing the dot notation against self. You have to do that. that. That syntax is required if you're using an instance variable. Self dot and then the variable name. The same with minute. Minute is an instance variable. And I have set hour to zero and minute to zero because I just want to initialize them to something. So basically what this does is this says, okay, Python, I have a class called time. In that class, when you create it, you're going to create it with two variables, hour and minute. And each and every object that I create is going to get its own hour and its own minute. So here is my class definition. I have hour, I have time, and I have hour, and I have minute. And that's my class definition. So how do we get it from the blueprint to the thing that I actually have in Python, to something that exists in the running memory of my program so that I personally can use it. Well, I have my class, so I want to instantiate my class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a variable. We know start time is a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. It is going to contain an object, in this case, of type time. And the way I create an object from the time class is to simply set it equal to time. And in this case, for right now, we're just going to have an open and closing parentheses. So it looks like I'm calling a function called time with a capital T. What I am doing is I am calling the instance method, that method, that init function in the time class. So what Python does is it says, okay, I have a variable. It wants a, an object of type time, and it takes and makes a copy of class time and adds it to an object. Don't quite look at that object down there because I haven't set the values yet. So I can then set Start time of hour is 11. So I'm assigning the value of 11 to hour, and I'm assigning the value of 10 to minute. So what I get, sorry, what I get over here, let's just play that. Okay. Let's just do this again real quick. Sorry about that. So what I get is I get an object of type class, with start time, and that's all good. Now I'm going to create another one, and I'm going to have a stop time, a variable called stop time. Stop time is going to be of type time, and I'm going to set hour equal to 2 and minute equal to 2. 
So here I have two objects created from the same class. Now, I could compare my start time and my stop time and maybe get a total time of the race. Maybe, um, you know, or keep start and stop times for a bunch of racers and, and compare who did well in what. So, again, class time. Yeah, so we have stop time, hour and minute, two and three. Constructors. Okay, every class has a constructor. You can't get rid of it. Um, a constructor define, is defined with def underscore underscore knit underscore underscore self. That's how you do it. They are a function that Python automatically calls, so you have to have it. And you can pass an argument to these constructors which means I can make my code even sleeker. I can have a class time, and I'm comparing here with and without constructors, sorry, without arguments. So what we saw a little bit ago was I have a def underscore underscore knit underscore underscore self. I have the constructor for time with only one argument, and that's self. By the way, self has to come first. If I want to do it with a constructor, I just have that constructor, but I've added two parameters to it. I've added an hour, and I've added a minute. And here, I ha in, in the um, class, the, the representation of time without any arguments, I'm going to set self hour to zero. However, in the constructor with arguments, I can set it right to the hour that the user wants me to do. The same with minute. Now, what is it different when I create them? Well, when I create them, on the left-hand side without the constructor, I have start time equal time open and close parentheses. So I get a time object. That time object is going to have self.hour of zero and self.minute of zero. On the right-hand side, the constructor arguments, with the one with constructor arguments, I have still called the constructor for time. However, I have added an hour and a minute. On the left-hand side, I still have to set my hour and minute separately. On the right-hand side, I don't. So, but there's more you can create your own instance methods. So here we have our time with our arguments. And now let's say I want to print the time. I always want it to look the same. I can define inside the class a, a function called print underscore time. I know it's an instance function because it has self as the first argument. And I'm just going to have a nice pretty format there to print. Now, I want to talk about scope for just a second because I didn't mention it earlier. Anything that you want to be part of the class definition has to be properly indented. It has to be indented so it is in the local scope of the class. Everything right here is indented properly and you have the local scope and so they are in the local scope of the class. When Python sees something not completely left justified, it's going to stop assuming that stuff's in a class. So you have to have it indented properly. Again, it's a spa Python is a space delimited language and it can be a little crazy. So here I've just created a new function called print time. And it's just like any other function that I have defined so, for, so far, except it has that word self in it. And inside that method, if I want to get to the hour that's stored inside an object, I just say self.hour. And if I want to get to the minute that is part of the instance variables for this class, I just say self.minute. So remember that self is important, and if you want 
the variables, you have to use self. Okay, if you want the instance variables, those variables that are actually physically copied into each object, if you want to get at them, you need to use self. I see a lot of students who define self and then when they go to access the actual variable, they, they just are like our. They don't put self and they don't understand why their program isn't running right. If it's inside the class, and you mean to have a different version of, let's say, hour for every different time that you're recording, it's got to start with self dot. So there, that's just my talk on self. So calling an instance method. So we have our class up here, which we have set our time, and we have our, our print. So now I'm going to create a time. Time is 11.11. I get my copy, and I'm going to call this, the copy is going to be a time, uh, an object of type time, and it's going to be stored in the variable start time. I'm going to get my stop time, which is 2 and 3. So I have another copy of the time class. In this case, it's a different object, and it's called stop time, and I want to print start time. So what is it going to print? Well, I have start time dot print name. Start time dot tells Python, go get me the information from the start time object. So it's going to go to the copy of that object that it's storing in memory. It's going to call it's going to go into the print time function and it's going to use self to get at the values. So in this case, when I start print time, or I print time for the start object, I'm going to get 11 and 11. So it's going to print out time as 11, 11. Now I can print for stop time. Stop time is a separate object, so there's a copy out there with a different hour and a different minute. So this time, and, I, and I, Python knows it because I've started the function call with stop time dot. So I have a copy of a time object that is being pointed to by stop time. So two and three, and I get two and three. Okay. Now we get into fun stuff because you can actually define your own um, your own operators. You can define like an equal equal operator. You can define a plus operator in your class and then you can compare start time to stop time by just doing equal equal and seeing if they're the same. It's 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 almost like magic to people who don't understand computer programming. But Python is one of the few languages that allows you to actually create your own operators in a class. Um, C++ is another one, at least from the years and years and years ago. I believe you can do it in C++. But um, this is called overloading. So Python already has the ability to do an equal equal. You know, it can say, is this integer the same as this other integer? Or is this string the same as this other string? However, you can do that for your self-defined classes. You can say, is start time the same as stop time? Um, you do this by defining other special functions. So for instance, if I wanted to overload the double equal sign, I could define a function with def underscore underscore eq underscore underscore open parentheses self. It's still an instance method. You've got to have self. And other. Other is just, by the way, a variable name. It doesn't it could have an x. And so that way I will compare what's in the object 
that was part of that dot notation and whatever whatever else other is. Self is the object and other is an argument which contains a different object from the same class. So let's overload equal equal and stir. So I have my class time, self, hour, and minute. I'm now defining stir. So instead of defining a print function, I'm going to define stir so that I can do stir, open parentheses, the object, close parentheses, and it will print out the format that you see here. I'm also going to define equal equal and what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to compare whether two objects are the same. So what I'm doing is I'm saying if self.hour is not other.hour or self.minute is not other.minute, then it's not the same. Otherwise, it is. Now, when you're overloading the operator, you have to remember what the outcome of the operator is. So for stir, the outcome needs to be a string. For equal, for the double equal, the outcome has to be a Boolean. So you have to keep that in mind when you are overloading your operators. So using an overloaded stir. So here's my class again. And I've condensed it because it's getting too big. So I have my start time. So I now have my start time object and my stop time. I have my stop time object. Let's say I want to print start time. If I print start time, Python is going to say, oh, I need to have, I, start time needs to be a string. Does class time have something that turns it into a string? Well, yes, it does. It has the underscore, underscore, stir, underscore, underscore method. So I'm just going to say, okay, so for start time, I'm going to get the hour and the minute, which is 11.11, .11, and I'm going to print it out. And then maybe I want to print stop time. Same thing's going to happen. So instead of having a print a separate print function, I can now use start and stop time anywhere I would normally use a string because I've overloaded the stir. Python in this case will even do the conversion to str it will say, okay, you gotta convert this to a string. So so let's look at the overloaded equal equal operator. Again, all of this is the same. This class time is something that we've done. So I have start time and I have stop time. Same objects. In this case, I'm going to say if start time is equal is is equivalent to stop time, then I'm going to print tie. What Python does when it sees this, it says, okay, start time, the object on the left of that double equal sign, is going to be self and stop time is going to be other. So it's going to say, on start time, call the underscore, underscore, EQ, underscore, underscore method, passing in stop time. So in this case, it's going to say, if self.hour, so that would be start time, so hour would be 11, is not equal to other.hour, which it's not, or self.minute is not equal to other.minute return false. So it's going to return false. But here's how you do it. You have self.hour, self.minute, other.hour, other.minute, and it's going to return false. And the nice thing is I've defined this. I could say, well, I only care if minutes are equal or I only care if the hours are equal or some other thing that you can think of, you're defining what that means. Kind of gives you a lot of power in programming, and it makes writing your code considerably easier. You are not having to define somewhere else a function that says, 
you know, are, you know, is time equal to or something like that. Okay. So now you can make your own module. So here I've created a module. And this is extending what you can do even farther. Because we've used modules, we've used the OS module. But now we can create our own. And in this case, I'm going to define a function called time, uh, sorry, a Python script called time.py. I'm going to type all this stuff out in time.py. And then I am going to allow people, by just typing the name, to import my time.py. And then they can just use my class. Now, I've just added a couple of things here to fill the class out some. Uh, in addition to stir and equal, I have NE, which is not equal to. And then I also have a diff. I want to know the difference in times. So I could create a time object because I want it to return a time object. And I can say the difference dot hour is self dot hour minus other. And the difference of minute is self dot minute minus other dot minute, and I return that difference object. So to use my time module, I just say from time import time. And then it tells Python, okay, Python, go find time.py, and from that import the time, the thing called time. And in this case, the thing called time is a class, so it's just going to import that class. Now, I could just import the entire module. Um, that's completely fine. But every time you import a Python script, it's going to copy that script into your running memory. So you might have a huge module and only need two classes. The, um, the expedient thing to do is to only import what you need. That's just kind of best practice. So, and in this case, instead of having to have all of that stuff in my in my my Python script, I don't need to worry about the definition of time. I just need to know that I can create a time with hour minutes. Oh, and I'm sorry, I added seconds to this, and I didn't add it to my class hours, minutes, and seconds, so I have start time and stop time, so I can print a tie, so I can do the double equal sign. Otherwise, if they're not equal, I can make, I can get the difference of start and stop time and print the delta. Now, the delta that's coming back is actually a time object, so all I have to do is say print delta, and it's going to go to the delta object and print the hours, minutes, and seconds. So there's time.py, so it imports time, so I get to use it. Okay, so before we go to the lab, let's go in. I know you've been listening to me chat for a half an hour. Let's go in and take a look. So I'll make this a little bit bigger. And then we'll go and we'll run through this a bit. So this is just my built-out time.py. So I have hours, minutes, and seconds here. So I've, let, me, let me go back. I have defined a class called time. In that class, I have a constructor. I have one, two, three, four overloaded methods and a method called diff. So, and I probably could have overloaded subtraction, but I'm not sure. I have to go look. So I have a constructor. Constructor takes three arguments, hours, minutes, and seconds. I have overloaded stir, so I can get this nice little format out from hours, minutes, and seconds. I have set, I've defined less than LT, so I can say, you know, self dot hours is less than other dot hours. It's true. If self dot hours is equal to other hours and self dot minute, is less than other minutes, then I return true. And then I've got this other one with hours, minutes, and seconds. I return true. And it, none of those are true. It returns false. 
Greater than is very similar. I have the equal, so I can do a double equal sign, returning true or false, and I have diff, which is a non-overloaded method. It's just the method I've created. So this is from this is my time module. So if I go into stopwatch, um, oops, sorry, it's a little bit too big. So I have from time import time. I'm importing a random here just so that um, it's easier for my race. I'm going to populate my race. Um, and I'm going to ask who started first, um, who's faster in the middle, and who won the race. And then I have my main method here, and I've got the tortoise and the hare, and I've got three intervals, start, middle, and end. And I'm going to populate my race with start, middle, and end. Um, and then I'm going to say... Who got the who started first? Um, who's faster in the middle and who won the race? So you'll not see the class in here. That's because I imported it. So let's run through this just real quick. And let's go to stop time. Okay. Uh, there it is. That's pseudocode. Wait a minute. There it is. Sorry about that. Uh, stopwatch. So if we just run through this really quick, we're going to debug it. Um, so what does my race? That's not it. Step over. Where am I? Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm up here. So I imported time, and I'm importing random. And then it just reads in. These are just functions that it's going to read in. And I'm going to now go into my main. I'm going to define my competitors. I have the tortoise and the hare. I'm going to define my intervals. Now I'm going to populate my race. So... When I populate my race, I'm now creating time objects. So I'm just doing for interval in interval. So I have two competitors, and I have three intervals. So I'm going to create six time objects. And I'm just going to step over. And I'm just creating a dictionary out of all this stuff. And you'll see that every time I hit this time object, it goes into my time class and it populates it. Now one of the things to look at here is when I'm out here, I have got this interdict. That's my that's just what I've called it. Now I can see um oh sorry, I'm gonna wait till I get to my race. So let's just continue on until I get to my race. Now I'm at my race. So let's take a look at my race. Where is it? My race is right there. So you'll see in my race that tortoise has a start, a middle, and an end. So I have a dictionary here. That dictionary has the word start because it's at the start of the race. And I've got this time object. And then middle has a time object. And end has a time object. Now, I know they're all different by looking at this because this hexadecimal, not really hexadecimal, this number here is different than this number here is different from that number there. Even though they're close, they're not identical. That means these are three separate time objects. That's how you read this. So I have the tortoise has three separate time objects and the hare has three separate time objects. So I've structured my data in a way that I can, in fact, go back and compare start. I can get start from tortoise and start from hare and compare them. So let's step over this 
So now I have my race that's all populated. And I want to know who started first. So I'm going to go into my function of who started first. And I'm going to define speedy start. And I'm going to get my race competitors. And then for all my race competitors, I'm going to go through. And I am going to check who started first. So I'm going to use the less than. And I have self. And I have other. And I'm going to step over these. And the speedy start. So I'm going to go back over these. And then I have my dictionary because maybe I have more than the tortoise and the hare. Maybe I have lots. And I can look at and go, okay, the hare. I'm going to convert that to a string. I'm going to output that. Who did the middle? Same thing's going to happen. Whoops. Well, we'll just ignore the fact that my code just crashed. Uh, middle key. Ah, uh, that's the problem. Right there. Right there. So that's why it crashed. But anyway, that's what was going on. Now, this is complex. What this does is this also shows you the intersection of object-oriented programming and functional programming. So, um, so I think I'm going to go to simple time for a second. This is the simple one. And I want to show you a couple things that I was talking about. I was talking about justification. Everything right now is justified so lines 20 Lines 1 through 20 is in is defined in the class. Everything from line 2 to 20 is inside the local scope of this class. If I do this, LT is no longer in the local scope of the class. So I can actually not do a less than between the two classes. So if I take this and I run it, this is simple time, simple time. I take this and I run it, stop and rerun. I'm going to enter 11, 11. I'm going to enter 2, sorry, 2 and 3. And I'm going to enter, sorry, 4 and 5. And I get an error. And I get the error because it says type error, less than not supported between instances of time and time. So on this line right here, I said is T less than min time. T and min time are both type time and it can't do it. And the reason that it happened was not because of anything I did lower in the code. It's because this is left justified, so it is not part of the local scope of the class. So to get this to work, I have to um, make sure that that LT is under, is inside the local scope of the class. So I'm just going to run this. 11, 11, 11, 22, 2, 3, 4, 5, and now I don't have a problem because I can call that LT the less than from here. So that's just something I wanted to let you know. That that is that's something that I've seen confuse people because you start to get large classes. You can get very large classes. And if you don't have the formatting correct, things are not going to uh, work the way you expect them. And even though there are no syntax error there, errors there, Python doesn't know that you want that in the class. That's not a syntax error. 
but it will cause your program to not run. So let's go back and we're going to go over the pseudocode. Okay, so we have this car constructor, and the car has a model, a price, and the value. And so we're going to define a class called car, just like we define time. We're going to define the constructor, as we always have to do. And the constructor is going to probably take three arguments. It's going to take the model year of the car. It's going to take model year, purchase price, and current value. Then it's going to calculate, it's going to define a function to calculate the current value. And it's going to take as the parameter the current year. So this is an instance method, so you have to remember the self. And then they've got a calculation that you have to do. There's a depreciation rate based on the year. The calculation's all pretty much in the... Um, in the lab. Now I want to define a function to print out the car information. This would be a really good place to overload STIR. Then outside the local scope of the class, we're going to define a main function. We're going to take a year, a price, and a current year. We're going to create a car object. We're, we're saying set the model year. We're going to set the model year, which could be done in the constructor. We're going to set the purchase price, which could be done in the constructor, and then we're going to calculate the current value of the car. And then we're going to call the function to print that information out. So if you look at time, all of this is there. Not the calculation, but the way to do this. Always remember the self. Always remember the special, um, the special syntax for defining the constructor. Lab 810, simple. Now we have a team. So we're going to have a team name, we're going to have the number of wins and the number of losses. And then we're going to get the win and loss percentage. So we're going to have a smaller class, it's going to have a constructor, and it's going to have a function called get win percentage. And by the way, you need to um, define these as you know, um, the same way Zybooks tells you to. You can't, like, say, you know, get win percentage without the underscore. Zybooks won't call it properly. Then I'm going to call the smaller function. I'm going to input the name of the team, the wins and the losses. I'm going to set the team wins and losses and the name. Now I could probably do that in a constructor. And then I'm going to... Um, I'm going to set the winning percentage by calling get win percentage. If the percentage is greater than five, I'm going to output the congratulations with some team stuff. Otherwise, I'm going to output team, team name has a losing average. So that is lab 8.9 and 8.10. I know that was a lot to take in. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, sorry. There was one in the chat and I was just talking. Okay. Um, do you guys have any questions? Okay, going once, going twice. I will say congratulations that you guys have finished the class. And I wish you well and good luck in your future programming careers. I am going to end the um, lecture, and I will have this posted tomorrow. I'm glad you've appreciated the lectures and the assistance. Uh, that's what I'm here for. I think there are a lot of good programmers out there who are not necessarily reading, writing learners. No problem. You guys uh, have a good evening, and I will talk to you later.